I'll admit I was skeptical about this first generation Apple Silicon MacBook Pro, but it won me over. Even though what Apple has done here is special, it might not be ready quite yet for illustration artists to jump in. Hello, my name is Brad and I review tech for creative professionals. And this is such a different product that I'm gonna be doing this review backwards and tell you my conclusions first and then tell you how I got there. Should you get this new M1 MacBook Pro? This is a tough call for me. The answer is no, I would wait. But what Apple has done here is incredible. And because this is so impressive in so many ways, I think, actually, I know that the second generation of Apple Silicon products we will see in a year or two will blow these out of the water. We're gonna see the performance get even better. You're gonna get more USB-C ports on your laptop. And as much as I love this little 13 inch MacBook Pro, I really miss that 16 inch screen. There are also a lot of things happening in Apple's new operating system, Big Sur, that point to the future of Macs being touch enabled. There are also specific things that for illustrators point to a mixed bag at this point, especially if you're using an external pen display or drawing tablet, those things haven't worked themselves out 100% quite yet. The one thing that truly blew me away was how well the software runs in Rosetta. You can throw benchmarks and numbers at me all day, and those benchmarks do look really good. It doesn't mean a thing if the software I rely on most every day is being emulated. I've always been an experience over raw power kind of person, and the experience here is great. Let's back this all up a little bit. Software that was written to run on Intel chips, which is most Macs and Windows computers, need to be reconfigured or recompiled or optimized, whatever word you want to use, in order for that software to work on these new M1 Apple Silicon Macs. Not all apps have. So what Apple has done is they've gone out, they've created some software, they're calling it Rosetta. And think of Rosetta like a language translator. Your software is speaking one language and your computer is speaking another. So Rosetta is translating so those two things can talk to each other. Like in real life, if I'm speaking to someone using a translator, that takes time. Now, for a computer, it takes far less time, but there's still something happening in the middle there. That usually means that the software that's being translated, in my case, we're talking about the Adobe apps, the Creative Cloud apps, they're not gonna run as fast as software that's designed specifically for Apple Silicon. And optimizing apps, takes time. Adobe says Photoshop's gonna be ready to go early next year. And they haven't given a timeline specifically for all of their apps, but I would expect those to kind of slowly roll out over the next year or so. But with that said, this is why I was blown away. It doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter because this is hands down by far the best emulated software I have ever used. You can't tell that this software, that Adobe Photoshop is not running natively. You can't tell that Premiere Pro is not running natively. There's no beach balls, there's no lag. You just can't tell. Microsoft is doing something similar with their transition to ARM-based processors. And if you saw my Surface Pro X review or my one year later follow-up I did a few weeks ago, I found Photoshop to be pretty much unusable for all day use. It worked but it was laggy, it was not fun. But here I am in Premiere Pro exporting a video for my super secret second channel that I'm launching in January. And this is exactly what I would expect to happen on my Intel Mac. The fact that it is rendering this quickly is insane. Now I am not throwing 4K or 8K footage at it, but for my everyday work, for my everyday workflow, I, I don't see much of a difference here. And this brings me to the second thing that really impressed me. When I was exporting that video, no fan noise. The jets didn't kick on. Computers make noise when you use them. That's what we've come to expect, whether it's a Windows computer, a Mac, probably Linux, I've never used a Linux computer, whatever, whatever they do, if they're doing something processor intensive like exporting video, you expect that fan to kick on. And the noise that my Macs have made over the last two generations of Macs that I've owned has really been a problem. They just need to get a lot of air out of them. They run hot. I have last year's 16 inch MacBook Pro. And honestly, I love the thing. The keyboard's great, the trackpad's great, the screen is great. But little things get to me during the day. For example, I don't keep Discord open all day 
because for whatever reason, there's some JavaScript running in Discord that causes my fan to spin up. And this has changed my behavior and how I actually use my laptop and how I work throughout the day. It's, it's a silly little thing, but I can have multiple Adobe apps open at the same time and the fans aren't running. It's not burning my lap. And that brings me to the third thing, which is battery life. It's for real. I grouse about this all the time in my reviews. My workflow is very video and graphics heavy, obviously. So a laptop that by all accounts has a great battery life for most folks just isn't going to cut it for me. I'm going to have to plug in after a few hours. So whatever numbers companies are putting out there are fairly meaningless to me. I just destroy them. For example, Samsung Galaxy Book Flex, it claimed 20 hours of battery life. I was lucky to get four out of it, and I thought that was pretty good. The MacBook makes similar claims, about 20 hours of battery life if you're watching video or whatever. I got around eight hours out of it, which is astounding. I was hoping I'd get five or six. In my video where I talked about the introduction of these Macs, I, I was pretty skeptical, but here I am. I'm truly surprised. I also run computers hot, you know, running Photoshop, Premiere Pro at the same time is gonna do that. Sometimes I'm running Adobe Animate at the same time. I, I like to load up all of these apps and just keep them all running in the background and jump between them. I also do a lot of my work in a beanbag chair. It's very comfortable and the laptop is sitting on my lap. And yeah, there are times where it just gets so hot that I gotta move to a desk and continue my work there. That's not happening here. This time of year, whenever I leave my office, Cat runs in and she falls asleep on the keyboard every single time. She don't want anything to do with it. Nancy the cat hates the new MacBook Pro. The biggest non-starter for me and for a lot of you is going to be the lack of graphic tablet drivers at this point. Talked with Wacom and they said they're working on something that'll be ready sometime next year. I would imagine Huion and XP Pen are in the same boat. So those things will come out, but if you're using any kind of external drawing device or peripheral that needs special drivers, they're probably not gonna work yet. I knew they wouldn't work, but I thought I'm gonna install and try this out anyway, and so I did. I was able to get my Wacom Cintiq 24 Pro to connect and work as a big touch screen, but the pen, it didn't do anything. The same thing with XP Pen and Huion displays. They work as second displays, but not as drawing tablets. Now, I did come across one forum post where someone said that they were able to get their Intuos tablet working on one of these M1 Macs. So I don't think it's impossible that you can get your tech up and running on this new MacBook, but I don't think it's a slam dunk guarantee either. So if you want to draw on this MacBook, the only way to do it right now is using an iPad and connecting it to this computer using the sidecar feature. It does seem snappier to me and it's very usable. There is some waviness to the lines when you're drawing with the Apple Pencil, so I'm still not a huge fan of sidecar for art and that sort of thing, but it works in a pinch. Another thing to keep in mind is just pure upgradability. The first two MacBooks that I owned, I would buy what I could afford at the time, and then I would upgrade them like two years down the road, adding more RAM, a bigger hard drive, get my computer more life, make it last a couple extra years. It's getting harder and harder to do that. And now with these M1 chips, the RAM is basically built onto the chip. So no RAM upgrades, you just can't do it. The other thing that holds this back for me is that there's only two USB-C ports. <laughs> Now, the fact that the battery lasts so long means that I don't have to keep this thing plugged in, which means that frees up one of those ports. That's kind of nice. But for me, the word pro means you're going to throw in all of those extra features and you're going to go the extra mile. And this device doesn't feel pro to me. It just feels pretty good. Since these are the very first M1 Max, what Apple has done here is really exciting for what the future holds. I really, really, really want a MacBook Pro 16 inch like this one that's just as cool with the same battery life, but with that bigger screen and more ports. I would also love, love a touchscreen Mac. Maybe a convertible, maybe, fingers crossed, Apple Pencil support. That's speculation. We're not sure that's gonna happen, but if you look at what Apple is doing in their new operating system, Big Sur, it's not outside of the realm of possibility. They've made a lot of the touch areas and things that you interact with bigger, which implies, hey, maybe they're gonna add touch. You could use, obviously, iPad and iPhone apps, which again, implies maybe touch. We don't know, but we'll see, but there are a lot of things pointing in that direction with this change to Apple Silicon that say it might actually happen.
All right, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the apps that I had the chance to test. I wanted to see what works and what doesn't. And I mentioned the Adobe apps earlier. They ran fine, including Adobe Illustrator and Adobe Animate. I use both of those. I didn't use Illustrator too much, but I was using Animate for a project and I was thinking, hey, this is working just as well here as it worked on my other Mac. I did hear that there is a beta version of Photoshop that you can try out that is running natively. I haven't been able to get that to work. The beta button in my Creative Cloud thing just doesn't do anything. I don't know, but it's available if you can figure out how to use it. I also heard that they don't have all of the features implemented in there yet. So I'm not sure exactly what it is. Is this more like the iPad version of Photoshop? Time will tell, and this may have been something that if I had heard, you know, going into this before I had used the product, I may have thought, ah, I don't know, this sounds kind of quirky, maybe we shouldn't touch these Apple Silicon Macs for a while. But since emulation works so well, I didn't really mind. Then there's Serif, which has Affinity Designer, Affinity Photo, Affinity Publisher. Those are ready to go. They work just as well as you'd expect them to. They are optimized, which means they're probably not gonna take up as much you know, battery, they're not gonna sip as much juice, and they work great. They're, they're wonderful apps. I mentioned before that iPad and iPhone apps can also run natively now on this Mac as well. So the first thing that I wanted to check out, it was literally the first thing I did once the Mac was set up, is I went to the App Store and I tried to download Procreate, my favorite iPad app. You can't download it here, it, it's iPad only. Only. Developers are given an option to include their apps in the Mac App Store or not, and it looks like Procreate has decided for the time being to just opt out of that. And honestly, that makes a lot of sense. Other apps like Infinite Painter, Art Studio Pro, they've opted to be available on the Mac, but it's not much fun to use because those apps are so dependent on having a touch screen, being able to like pinch and zoom or tap your fingers to undo and that sort of thing, that when you lose that touch ability on the Mac, it's just not special anymore. You can hook up your iPad and you sidecar, but then at that point, you might as well just use it on the iPad. Games are also a mixed bag. Steam told me my games wouldn't work. And I was like, you're not the boss of me, Steam. And so I downloaded them anyway. I should have listened because they didn't work. I did get Minecraft up and running. It works fine. It's not screaming or anything, but it's fine. I found a document over on Reddit. Uh, folks have been sharing their experience running various games, either natively or through Rosetta. So if you don't mind 13 frames per second, I guess you can run like Shadow of the Tomb Raider on this thing. I'll link that doc down below in the description. So that's my experience so far with the new MacBook Pro 13. I really did think that this transition would go smoother than Microsoft's transition to ARM, mostly because of Apple's my way or the highway approach to things. I didn't expect it to be this smooth, this early, and it comes down to how well Rosetta emulates things. I have no idea how they did it, but they somehow did. And you add in that better battery life, the lack of heat, and this laptop is remarkable. If you don't care about ever attaching a pen display to your computer, then this is a fantastic Mac for you. Here you go. If you can wait, I think it might be worth it. I think we're gonna see some really cool Macs coming down the road in a year, two years. So if you don't need to upgrade yet, just hold off a little bit. But what do you think? Let me know down below in the comment section. Thank you all for watching and I'll talk to you in a couple of days.